Jimmy Goggles the God by H.G. Wells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clayton Whittle. It isn't everyone who's been a god, said the sunburnt man, but it's happened to me, among other things. I intimated my sense of his condescension. It didn't leave much for ambition, does it? said the sunburnt man. I was one of those men who were saved from the ocean pioneer. Gummy how the time flies. It's twenty years ago. I doubt if you'll remember anything of the ocean pioneer. The name was familiar, and I tried to recall when and where I had read it. The ocean pioneer. Something about gold dust, I said vaguely, but the precise... That's it, he said, in a beastly little channel where she hadn't no business in dodging pirates. It was before they'd put the kibosh on that business, and there'd been volcanoes or something, and all the rocks was wrong. There's places about sooner where you fair have to follow the rocks about to see where they're going next. Down she went in twenty fathoms before you could have dealt a whist with fifty thousand pounds worth of gold aboard said in one form or another survivors three ah I remember the case now I said there was something about salvage but at the word salvage the sunburnt man exploded into language so extraordinarily horrible that I stopped aghast he came down to more ordinary swearing and pulled himself up abruptly excuse me he said but salvage he leant over towards me. I was in that job, he said. Tried to make myself a rich man, and I got made a god instead. I've got my feelings. It ain't all that jam being a god, said the sunburnt man, and for some time conversed by means of such pity but unprogressive axioms. At last he took up his tale again. There was me, said the sunburnt man and a seaman named Jacobs, and always the mate of the ocean pioneer. And him it was that set the whole thing going. I remember him now when we was in the jolly boat, suggesting it all to our minds just by one sentence. He was wonderful at suggesting things. There was 40,000 pounds, he said, on that ship, and it was for me to say just where she went down. It didn't need much brains to tumble to that, and he was a leader from first to last. He got hold of Sanders's and their brig. They were brothers. And the brig was the pride of Banya. And he it was bought the diving dress, a second-hand one with a compressed air apparatus instead of pumping. He'd have done the diving too, if it hadn't made him sick going down. And the salvage people were mucking about with a chart he'd cooked up, as solemn as could be at Star Race, 120 miles away. I can tell you we was a happy lot aboard that brig, jokes and drink and bright hopes all the time. It all seemed so neat and clean and straightforward, and what rough chaps call a cert. And we used to speculate about how the other blessed lot, the proper salvagers, who'd started two days before us, were getting on, until our sides fairly ached. We all messed together in the Sanders' cabin. It was a curious crew, all officers and no men. And there stood the diving dress, waiting its turn. Young Sanders was a humorous sort of chap, and there certainly was something funny in the confounded thing's great fat head and its stare. And he made us see it, too. Jimmy Goggles, he used to call it. And talked to it in like a Christian manner. Asked if he was married. Asked how Mrs. Goggles was, and all the little Goggleses. Fit to make you split. And every blessed day all of us used to drink the health of Jimmy Goggles in rum and unscrew his eye and pour a glass of rum in him until, instead of that nasty Macintosherness smell, he smelled as nice in his inside as a cask of rum. It was jolly times we had in those days, I can tell you. Little suspecting, poor chaps, what was a coming? We weren't going to throw away our chances by any blessed hurry, you know. 
and we spent a whole day signing our way towards where the ocean pioneer had gone down, right between two chunks of ropey gray rock, lava rocks that rose nearly out of the water. We had to lay off about half a mile to get a safe anchorage, and there was a thundering row who should stop on board, and there she lay just as she has gone down, so that you could see the top of the mast that was still standing perfectly distinctly, the row ending and all coming in the boat. I went down in the diving dress on Friday morning directly it was light. What a surprise it was. I, I can see it all now quite distinctly. It was a queer looking place and the light was just coming. People over here think every blessed place in the tropics is a flat shore and palm trees and surf, bless them. This place for instance wasn't a bit that way. Not common rocks they were, undermined by waves, but great curved banks like ironwork cinder heaps, with green slime below, and thorny shrubs and things just waving upon them there, in that water glassy calm and clear, and showing you a kind of dirty gray black shine, with huge flaring red brown weeds, spreading motionless, and crawling and darting things going through it. And far away beyond the ditches and the pools and the heaps was a forest on the mountain flank, growing again after the fires and cinders showering of the last eruption. And the other way, forest too. And a kind of broken, oh, what is it? Amphitheater of black and rusty cinders rising out of it all. And the sea in a kind of bay in the middle. The dawn, I say, was just coming. And there wasn't much color about things. Not a human being but ourselves anywhere in sight, up or down the channel, except the pride of Banya, laying out beyond a lump of rocks toward the line of the sea. Not a human being in sight, he repeated, and paused. I don't know where they come from, not a bit. And we were feeling so safe we were all alone that poor young Sanders was a-singing. I was in Jimmy Goggles, all except the helmet. Easy, says always, there's your mast. And after I had just one squint over the gun wall, I caught up the bogey and almost tipped out as old Sanders brought the boat around. When the windows were screwed and everything was all right, I shut the valve from the air belt in order to help my sinking and jumped overboard, feet foremost, for we hadn't a ladder. I left the boat pitching and all of them staring down into the water after me as my head sank down into the weeds and blackness that lay about the mast. I suppose nobody, not the most cautious chap in the world, would have bothered about a look at it such a desolate place. It stunk of solitude. Of course, you must understand, I was a greenhorn at diving. None of us were divers. We'd had to muck about with the thing to get the way of it, and this was the first time I'd been deep. It feels damnable. Your ears hurt beastly. I don't know if you've ever hurt yourself yawning or sneezing, but it takes you like that, only ten times worse, and a pain over the eyebrows here, splitting, and a feeling like influenza in the head, and it isn't all heaven in your lungs and things, and going down feels like the beginning of a lift, only it keeps on, and you can't turn your head to see what's above you, and you can't get a fair squint of what's happening at your feet without bending down something painful. And being deep, it was dark, let alone the blackness of the ashes and mud that formed the bottom. It was like going down at the dawn, back into the light, so to speak. The mass came up like a ghost of the black, and then a lot of fishes, and then a lot of flapping red seaweed, and then whack, I came with a kind of dull bang on the deck of the ocean pioneer, and the fishes that had been feeding on the dead rose about me like a swarm of flies from road stuff in summertime. I turned on the compressed air again, for the suit was a bit thick and Macintoshery after all, in spite of the rum, and stood recovering myself. It struck coolish down there, and that helped to take off the stuffiness a bit. When I began to feel easier, I started looking about me. It was an extraordinary sight. Even the light was extraordinary kind of reddy colored twilight on account of the streamers of seaweed that floated up on either side of the ship and far overhead just a moony deep green blue. The deck of the ship, except for a slight list to starboard, was level 
and lay all dark and long between the weeds, clear except where the mast had snapped when she rolled, and vanishing in the black night towards the forecastle. There wasn't any dead on the decks, most were in the weeds alongside, I suppose. But afterwards, I found two skeletons lying in the passengers' cabins where death had come to them. It was curious to stand on that deck and recognize it all bit by bit. A place against the rail where I had been fond of smoking by starlight, and the corner where an old chap from Sydney used to flirt with a widow he had aboard. A comfortable couple they'd been only a month ago. And now, you couldn't have got a meal for a baby crab off either of them. I've always had a bit of philosophical turn, and I dare say I spent the best part of five minutes in such thoughts before I went below to find where the blessed dust was stored. It was slow work, hunting, feeling it was for the most part, pitchy dark, with confusing blue gleams down the companion. And there were things moving about, a dab at my glass once, and once a pinch at my legs, crabs I expect. I kicked a lot of loose stuff that puzzled me, and stooped and picked up something all knobs and spikes. What do you think? It's a backbone. But I never had any particular feeling for bones. We had talked the affair over pretty thoroughly, and I always knew just where the stuffed box was stowed. I found it that trip. I lifted a box one end an inch or more. He broke off his story. I've lifted it, he said. As near as that. Forty thousand pounds with the pure gold. Gold! I shouted inside my helmet as it kind of cheer and hurt my eyes. I was getting confounded stuffy and tired by this time. I must have been down twenty and five minutes or more. And I thought this was good enough. I went up the companion again. And as my eyes came up flush with the deck, a thundering great crab gave a kind of hysterical jump and went scuttling off sideways. Quite a start it gave me. I stood up clear on deck and shut the valve behind the helmet to let the air accumulate to carry me up again. I noticed a kind of whacking from above, as though they were hitting the water with an oar, but I didn't look up. I fancied they were signaling for me to come up. And then, something shot down by me, something heavy, and I stood a quiver on the planks. I looked and there was a long knife I'd seen young Sanders handling. Thinks I, he's dropped it, and I was still calling him this kind of fool in that, for it might have hurt me serious when I began to lift up and drive towards the daylight. Just about the level of the top spars of the ocean pioneer, whack, I came up against something sinking down, and a boot knocked in front of my helmet. Then something else, struggling frightful, it was a big weight atop of me, whatever it was, and moving and twisting about. I'd have thought it a big octopus or some such thing if it hadn't been for the boot, but octopuses don't wear boots. It was all in a moment, of course. I felt myself sinking down again, and I threw my arms up about me to keep steady, and the whole lot rolled free of me and shot down as I went up. He paused. I saw young Sanders' face over a naked black shoulder, and a spear driven clean through his neck, and out of his mouth and neck what looked like spirits of pink smoke in the water, and down they went clutching one another, and turning over, and both too far gone to leave go, and in another second my helmet came a whack fit to split against the nigger's canoe. It was niggers, two canoes full. It was lively times, I tell you. Overboard came always with three spears in them. There was the legs of three or four black chaps kicking about me in the water. I couldn't see much, but I saw the game was up at a glance. Gave my valve a tremendous twist and went bubbling down again after poor always. In as awful a state of a scare and astonishment as you could well imagine. I passed young Sanders and the nigger going up again and struggling still a bit. And in another moment, I was standing in the dim again on the deck of the ocean pioneer. Gummy, I think, sir. Here's a fix. Niggers. At first I couldn't see anything for it but stifle below or stabs above. I didn't properly understand how much air there was to last me, but I didn't feel like standing very much more of it down below. I was hot and frightfully heady, quite apart from the blue funk I was in. We'd never repine with these beastly natives, filthy Papuan beasts. 
It wasn't any good coming up where I was, but I had to do something. On the spur of the moment, I clambered over the side of the brig and landed among the weeds, and set off through the darkness as fast as I could. I just stopped once and knelt, and twisted back my head in the helmet and had to look up. It was a most extraordinary bright green-blue above, and the two canoes in the boat floating there were small and distant like a kind of twisted H, and it made me feel sick to squint up at it and think what the pitching and swaying of the three meant. It was just about the most horrible ten minutes I ever had, blundering about in the darkness, pressure something awful, like being buried in sand, pain across the chest, sick with funk, and breathing nothing as it seemed but the smell of rum and Macintosh. Gummy. After a bit, I found myself going up a steeper sort of slope. I had another squint to see if anything was visible of the canoes and boats, and then kept on. I stopped with my head a foot from the surface, and tried to see where I was going, but, of course, nothing was to be seen but the reflection of the bottom. Then out I dashed, like knocking my head through a mirror. Directly I got my eyes out of the water. I saw I'd come up on a kind of beach near the forest. I had to look around, but the natives and the brig were both hidden by a big, hummocky heap of twisted lava. The born fool in me suggested a run for the woods. I didn't take the helmet off, but eased open one of the windows, and after a bit of a pant, went on out of the water. You'd hardly imagine how clean and light the air tasted. Of course, with four inches of lead in your boot soles and your head in a copper knob the size of a football, and being thirty-five minutes underwater, you don't break any records running. I ran like a plowboy going to work. And halfway to the trees, I saw a dozen niggers or more coming out in a gaping, astonished sort of a way to meet me. I just stopped dead and cursed myself for all the fools out of London. I had about as much chance of cutting back to the water as a turned turtle. I just screwed up my window again to leave my hands free and waited for them. There wasn't anything else for me to do. But they didn't come on very much. I began to suspect why. Jimmy Goggles, I says. It's your beauty, does it? I was inclined to be a little lightheaded, I think, with all these dangers about and the change in the pressure of the blessed air. Who are you staring at? I said, as if the savages could hear me. What do you take me for? I'm hanged if I don't give you something to stare at, I said. And with that, I screwed up the escaped valve and turned on the compressed air from the belt until I was swelled out like a blown frog. Regular and posing I must have been. I'm blessed if they come on a step. And presently, one and then the other went down on their hands and knees. They didn't know what to make of me, and they was doing the extra polite, which was very wise and reasonable of them. I had half a mind to edge back seaward and cut and run, but it seemed too hopeless. I stepped back and they'd have been after me, and out of sheer desperation, I began to march towards them up the beach with slow, heavy steps, and waving my blown out arms about in a dignified manner, and inside of me I was singing as a small bit of Tom did. But there's nothing like striking an appearance to help a man over a difficulty. I found that before and since. People like ourselves, who are up to diving dresses by the time we're seven, can scarcely imagine the effect of one on a simple-minded savage. One or two of these niggers couldn't run and the others started in a great hurry trying to knock their brains out on the ground. And on I went, as slow and solemn and silly looking and artful as a jobbing plumber. It was evident they took me for something immense. Then up jumped one and began pointing, making extraordinary gestures to me as he did so. And all the others began sharing their attention between me and something out of the sea. What's the matter now, I said. I turned slowly on account of my dignity, and there I saw, coming around a point, the poor old pride of Banya towed by a couple of canoes. The sight fairly made me sick, but they evidently expected some recognition, so I waved my arms in a striking sort of non-committal manner, and then I turned and stalked on towards the trees again. At that time I was praying like mad, and I remember over and over again, Lord help me through it, Lord help me through it. It's only fools who know nothing of dangers can afford to laugh at praying. But these niggers weren't going to let me walk through in a way like that. They started to kind of bow and dance at me, 
and sort of pressed me to take a pathway that lay through the trees. It was clear to me they didn't take me for a British citizen, whatever else they thought of me. And for my own part, I was never less anxious to own up to the old country. You'd hardly believe, perhaps, unless you're familiar with the savages. But these poor, misguided, ignorant creatures took me straight to their kind of joss place to present me to the blessed old black stone there. By this time, I was beginning to sort of realize the depth of their ignorance, and directly I set eyes on this deity I took my cue. I started a baritone howl. Wow. Wow. Very long and on one note, and began waving my arms about a lot, and then very slowly and ceremoniously turned their image over on its side and sat down on it. I wanted to sit down badly, for diving dresses ain't much wear in the tropics. Or, to put it different like, they're a sight too much. It took away their breath, I could see, my sitting on their jaws. But in less time than a minute they made up their minds and were hard at work worshipping me. And I can tell you I felt a bit relieved to see things turning out so well, in spite of the weight on my shoulders and feet. But what made me anxious was what the chaps in the canoes might think when they came back. If they'd seen me in the boat before I went down, and without the helmet on, for they might have been spying and hiding since overnight, they would very likely take a different view from the others. I was in a deuce of a stew about that for hours, as it seemed, until the shindy of the arrival began. But they took it down. The whole blessed village took it down. At the cost of sitting up stiff and stern, as much like those sitting Egyptian images one sees as I could manage for pretty nearly twelve hours, I should guess at least, I got over it. You'd hardly think what it meant in the heat and stink. I don't think any of them dreamt of the man inside. I was just a wonderful leathery great joss that had come up with a luck out of the water. But that fatigue, the heat, the beastly closeness, the Macintosherness and the rum, and the fuss. They lit a stinking fire on a kind of lava slab there was before me, and brought up in a lot of gory muck, the worst parts of what they were feasting on outside, the beasts, and burnt it all in my honor. I was getting a bit hungry, but I understood now how gods managed to do without eating, what with the smell of burnt offerings about them. And they brought up in a lot of stuff that they would got off the brig, and among other stuff, what I was a bit relieved to see, the kind of pneumatic pump that was used for the compressed air affair. And then, a lot of chaps and girls came in and danced about me, something disgraceful. It was extraordinary in the different ways different people have a show in respect. If I'd had a hatchet handy, I'd have gone for the lot of them. They made me feel that wild. All this time, I sat as stiff as company, not knowing anything better to do. At last, when nightfall came, and the Waddle Joss House place got a bit too shadowy for their tastes. All these here savages are afraid of dark, you know, and I started to sort of moo noise. They built big bonfires outside and left me alone in peace in the darkness of my hut, free to unscrew my windows a bit and think things over, and feel just as bad as I liked. And Lord, I was sick. I was weak and hungry and my mind kept on behaving like a beetle on a pin. Tremendous activity and nothing done at the end of it, come round just where it was before. There was sorrowing for the other chaps, beastly drunkard certainly, but not deserving such a fate. And young Sanders with the spear through his neck wouldn't go out of mind. There was a treasure down in the ocean pioneer, and how one might get in and hide it somewhere safer and get away and come back for it. And there was a puzzle where to get anything to eat. I tell you, I was fair rambling. I was afraid to ask by signs for food for fear of behaving too human. And so there I sat and hungered until very near the dawn. The village got a bit quiet and I couldn't stand it any longer. And I went out and got some stuff like artichokes in a bowl and some sour milk. What was left of these I put away among the other offerings just to give them a hint of my tastes. And in the morning they came to worship and found me sitting up stiff and respectable on their previous god, just as they'd left me overnight. I'd got my back against the central pillar of the hut, and 
practically I was asleep. And that's how I became a god among the heathen. A false god, no doubt, and blasphemous, but one can't always pick and choose. Now, I don't want to crap myself up as a god beyond my merits, but I must confess that while I was god to these people, they was extraordinarily successful. I don't say there's anything in it, mind you. They want to battle with another tribe. I got a lot of offerings I didn't want through it. They had a wonderful fishing, and their crop of power was extremely fine, and they counted the capture of the brig among the benefits I brought them. I must say, I don't think that was a poor record for a perfectly new hand. And though perhaps you scarcely credit it, I was the tribal guide of those beastly savages for pretty nearly four months. What else could a man do? But I didn't wear that diving dress all the time. I made them rig me up a sort of holy of holies, and a deuce of a time I had, too, making them understand what it was I wanted them to do. That indeed was great difficulty, making them understand my wishes. I couldn't let myself down by talking their lingo badly, even if I'd been able to speak it at all. And I couldn't go flapping a lot of gestures at them, so I drew pictures in sand and sat down beside them and hooted like one o'clock. Sometimes they did things I wanted all right, and sometimes they did them all wrong. They were always very willing, certainly. All the while I was puzzling how I was to get the confounded business settled. Every night before dawn I used to march out in full rig and go off to a place where I could see the channel in which the ocean pioneer lay sunk. And once even, one moonlight night, I tried to walk out to her, but the weeds and rock and dock clean beat me. I didn't get back till full day, and then I found all those silly niggas out on the beach praying their sea god to return them. I was that vexed and tired, messing and tumbling about, and coming up and going down again. I could have punched their silly heads all round when they started rejoicing. I'm hanged if I lack so much ceremony. And then came the missionary. That missionary. It was in the afternoon, and I was sitting in state over my outer temple place, sitting on that old black stone of theirs when he came. I heard a row outside and jabbering, then his voice speaking to an interpreter. They worship stocks and stones, he said, and I knew what was up in a flash. I had one of my windows out for comfort, and I sang out straight away on the spur of the moment. Stocks and stones, I says. You come inside, I says, and I'll punch your bloomin' head. There was a kind of silence and more jabbering, and then he came, Bible in hand, after the manner of them, a little sandy chap in specks and a pitch helmet. I flatter myself that me sitting there in the shadows with my copper head of my big goggles struck him a bit of a heap at first. Well, I says... How's the trade in Calico? For I don't hold with missionaries. I had a lark with that missionary. He was a raw hand and quite outclassed with a man like me. He gasped out who was I, and I told him to read the inscription at my feet if he wanted to know. Down he goes to read, and his interpreter, being of course as superstitious as any of them, took it as an act of worship and plumped down like a shot. All my people gave a howl of triumph, and there wasn't any more business to be done in my village after that journey, not by the likes of him. But of course, I was a fool to choke him off like that. If I'd had any sense, I should have told him straight away of the treasure and taken him into company. I've no doubt he'd have come into company. A child with few hours to think it over could have seen the connection between my diving dress and the loss of the ocean pioneer. A week after he left, I went out one morning and saw the Motherhood, the salvage ship from Star Race, towing up the channel and sounding. The whole blessed game was up, and all my trouble was thrown away. Gummy how wild I felt, and guying it in that stinking silly dress four months. The sunburnt man's story denigrated again. Think of it, he said when he emerged to linguistic purity once more. Four to thousand pounds worth of gold. Did the little missionary come back? I asked. Oh yes, bless him. And he pledged his reputation there was a man inside the god, and started out to see as much with tremendous ceremony. But there wasn't. 
he got sold again. I always did hate scenes and explanations, and long before he came I was out of it all, going home to Banya along the coast, hiding in bushes by day and thieving food from the villages at night, only weapon a spear, no clothes, no money, nothing. My face was my fortune as the saying is, and just a squeak of 8,000 pounds of gold, fifth share. But the natives cut up rusty, thank goodness, because they thought it was him had driven their luck away. Jimmy Goggles the God by H.G. Wells Recording by Clayton Whittle